Oh, good. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. And I'm very, very happy to uh, welcome you this afternoon to what uh, is going to be a, a wonderful presentation. I would just mention that um, the Dickey Center will be celebrating its 25th anniversary. Uh, we're marking it uh, uh, really through this whole winter term. And uh, we've prepared a, a very special uh, series of events. And today's uh, speaker is certainly uh, one of the very special uh, occasions you know, during this uh, celebration period. Today's event um, is the Rabbi Marshall Meyer Great Issues Lecture on Social Justice. Uh, this is an annual Dickey Center event. This is now the, the second year that this has been held. And it was made possible by a very generous gift from Andrew and Marina Lewin. Andrew Lewin uh, is a member of the Dartmouth class of 1981. Rabbi Meyer, Rabbi Marshall Meyer, graduated from Dartmouth in 1952. He founded the Seminario Rabbinico Latinoamericano, a rabbinical school that became a center for conservative Judaism in Latin America. During the years of the Argentinian military regime, that is from 1976 through 1982, Rabbi Meyer became a strong critic of the military government and its violations of human rights. He worked to save the lives of hundreds of, of people that were being persecuted by the regime and he visited prisoners in their cells, among them the renowned journalist Jacobo Timmerman, who dedicated his book to the rabbi who, in his words, and I quote, brought solace to Jewish, Christian, and atheist prisoners, unquote. This annual lecture, drawing on the Jewish value of Tichun Olom, Repairing the World Through Social Action features a person who is truly helping to, quote, heal the world, unquote, and thereby expressing the values that Rabbi Meyer saw as the core of Judaism. I would also just mention a word about this series of lectures, the Dickey Center's Great Issues Lectures. These commemorate President John Dickey's conviction embodied in the Great Issues course that was taught at Dartmouth during his presidency that an important part of a Dartmouth education is acquiring competence in civic engagement and responsibility. The world's troubles are your troubles, he told Dartmouth students at convocation in 1946. And there is nothing wrong with the world that better human beings cannot fix. I take great pleasure now in um, calling to the podium Professor Susanna Heschel uh, of the Department of Religion, who will introduce uh, our speaker today, Dr. Lifton. Susanna. <laughs> Robert J. Lifton is one of America's leading intellectuals and moral heroes, and it's a great honor to introduce him here today. As professor of psychiatry at Yale and at Harvard, he has transcended the disciplinary boundaries of the academy and has brought to life a remarkably vital community of scholars and activists and intellectuals and writers through his work, through his personal engagement in political issues, through his consultations, through his friendships, the Wellfleet Seminar that he established in the 1960s with Eric Erickson continues to meet annually to discuss issues of war, terrorism, genocide, trauma, and violence, bringing together political journalists, academics, novelists, activists, and psychiatrists, and in a sense embodies on a small scale what Professor Lifton has accomplished on a global scale. Early in his career, Professor Lifton spent several years in Japan, 
studying the impact of atomic warfare on its survivors. That book, Death and Life, Survivors of Hiroshima, was extraordinarily influential in the United States and Japan and throughout the world in calling our attention to atrocities and their lasting aftermaths. His subsequent studies of perpetrators of war crimes in his book, Home from the War, Vietnam Veterans, Neither Victims Nor Executioners, which was published in 1973, and his book, The Nazi Doctors, published in 1986, forged new paths of scholarship in the study of perpetrator mentalities. The Nazi Doctors, which is assigned as a text and courses on the Holocaust here at Dartmouth and around the world, is the most comprehensive study of the medicalization of Nazism and the Holocaust and of the psychology of the doctors who tortured and murdered. Thanks to Professor's hard work and his courage in pursuing this topic, he obtained interviews with doctors who had worked in the so-called euthanasia program and in the death camps, material that is invaluable for future generations of historians. This is a book we'll continue to read for many generations to come. In more recent years, Professor Lifton has written about the protean self, a term he coined to describe the fluid and changing personalities we adopt in modern societies, and it is the title of his book. Other recent books have been studies of contemporary apocalyptic movements, including a recent book on the Japanese sect, Om Shinrikyo, which is entitled Destroying the World to Save It. He has long been a forceful opponent of nuclear weapons and a strong voice against aggressive militarism. Professor Lifton is a person of intellectual brilliance and of great moral courage. He has inspired us and he serves as a role model for academics, for students, for physicians, for all of us concerned about the future of humanity. It's a great privilege and honor to have him at Dartmouth today, and it is a fitting tribute to our great alumnus, Rabbi Marshall Meyer, that he will present his lecture today on superpower syndrome and beyond toward a more humane future. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lifton. Thanks so much. I, I appreciate that uh, generous, no doubt over generous introduction uh, by Susanna Heschel. Uh, the one thing she didn't mention about my nefarious work is that I have a, a kind of avocation of drawing ostensibly humorous bird cartoons. So when people say, how can you study all these horrible things and still stay sane, if one can make that assumption. My answer is I draw bird cartoons. They, they don't reflect any um, artistic talent. They're kind of stick figures, but they can say some things very directly. And they're useful for a moment like this in order to avoid believing in an introduction like that. Uh, and in the, and I, the one that I want to mention to you, which I call my existential classic, uh, a young, naive, uh, enthusiastic bird looks up and says, all of a sudden, I had this wonderful feeling, I am me. <laughs> and an older, larger, more skeptical, more jaundiced bird looks down on him and says, you are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, I begin. I am really pleased to be here at Dartmouth. Uh, I, I do appreciate the intellectual and personal hospitality I've already had. Uh, from Kenneth Yalowitz uh, and his associates, and of course from Susanna, who's an old friend with, with common uh, ethical and political concerns for many years. And I'm especially pleased to be giving a talk in the name of Marshall Meyer, who was a warm friend of mine and my wife's. Uh, he was a remarkable man who pursued his religious and secular truths with enormous energy and brilliance but more important, lived them out, lived out those principles with extraordinary courage. Uh, he risked his life uh, repeatedly in Argentina, and he never stepped back from an issue that he felt had to do with uh, human well-being or the violation of human well-being. When I think of Marshall, I, I think of all kinds of political concerns we shared, sometimes with sadness and anger, but I also think of fun that we had and laughs that we had. 
Uh, he was a man who had a great sense of absurdity and could appreciate my bird cartoons. Uh, uh, he was a person uh, who really, as much as anybody I've ever known, really embodied the merger of heart and mind. In my own case, uh, getting to this afternoon's uh, subject, uh, I sometimes feel a little awkward here. It's to be the celebration of 25 years. Uh, and what I have to tell you is not always too celebratory. And in fact, I sometimes feel a little embarrassed in walking into a room because I know that people are looking at me and worrying and thinking, What's he, what horror is he going to bring us next? Uh, but there, there is truth, I sometimes say, uh, that when I'm in demand, you know the world's in trouble. <laughs> in any case, uh, I think the world is in a kind of limbo now. Our country is in a kind of limbo. But with limbo, there's enormous danger and also possibility. It's a, it's a destructive and self-destructive realm of behavior that we're still very much in, dominated by a war, the war in Iraq that we initiated, and by an immediate struggle between those who want to escalate the war, they have this funny word they call surge, and those who want to end the war, and then with disputes about how best to end it. Uh, I, I don't come to this neutrally. I have very strong views on it. And my, my last two books that I've, uh, one of them is called Superpower Syndrome, will concern things that I'll be talking about. But the other that's just out in the last couple of months, I co-edited with Richard Fork and Irene Genzier, which is called Crimes of War, Iraq. And strangely, um, or not so strangely, it's modeled on a book that Falk and I and, and Colco edited 35 years ago called Crimes of War. And it was, of course, about Vietnam. And there's something deeply sad when one is involved in two books over a span of 35 years involving uh, wars that we've begun that were wrong-headed and indeed evil. In these books, uh, I, I try to bring, in these books and in what I want to talk to you about tonight, I want to bring decades of work that I've done, uh, or at least a few thoughts coming from them, to bear on our present situation. Because I think we have to move through that psychological and historical darkness that we're in now, look at it carefully, and try to see something that's behind it in order to emerge from it with the spirit of hope, which I very much feel. And from the very examination of problems of this kind uh, can be an act of hope, because in going through that, uh, that darkness, we emerge with some knowledge and with an advocacy of an alternative direction. So it's a principle of looking into the abyss in order to see beyond it. You don't want to be stuck in the abyss and immobilized on the other hand, you can't avoid looking into it uh, without being ostrich-like. And I do, I speak to you tonight very much in that spirit. What I want to do is take you on a bit of a, a journey, um, first through some past work, just briefly in terms of some thoughts that have come from it that have all too much bearing on our present situation. Second, some exploration of what can be called apocalyptic violence in the world, which we, in which we have all too much joined in, uh, and that in relationship to what I call superpower syndrome. And then finally, the directions of hope having to do with the survivor meanings we give to uh, large American collective traumas of recent times, including those in Vietnam, 9-11, and now the Iraq War, uh, and the alternatives to the superpower syndrome that we can bring from those survivals. My approach is what we call psychohistorical, and that really means, very simply, the application of psychological methods to historical questions. Eric Erickson is a great figure in all this because he broke out of the earlier psychoanalytic idea of reducing history to psychopathology, and he worked from the principle of the great person in history, the operative word being in, in his great psychobiographies of Luther and Gandhi. Uh, 
In my own approach, influenced by him, I use instead what, a, what I call a pro, an approach of shared themes, I try to interview people in psychohistorical work having to do with relatively recent history uh, who have been part of a group that has been acted upon in important ways or which has itself acted upon history or historical forces, and usually it's both. And that's what I've tried to do in the particular studies that I've made. And I try to use the interview method, which is something that I think people should think more about. As old as it is, it's still neglected and has powerful reverberations and value in almost any kind of discipline. Uh, the first main study that I did, I did way back in the mid-50s as a very young psychiatrist in Hong Kong interviewing people coming out of China and studying Chinese communist thought reform or so-called brainwashing. Uh, without saying much about it, I realize now that this effort on the part of the Chinese communists at that time in their ideological phase to control all of thought in that vast nation, all of human mind in that nation was itself an apocalyptic expression in the mental sphere. Uh, and they actually over-reform people so that, in a way, uh, they became counterproductive because through this pseudo-religious impulse to control the minds, uh, to develop what I came to call the ownership of the mind and the ownership of truth, there were reactions to it, which say something for the human spirit. Uh, and this brought me to a whole study of totalism, all or none belief systems and ethical claims, which continue to bedevil us and are a profound human problem uh, in so many expressions. Now, in studying Chinese thought reform, uh, even, even then I realized that it obviously totalism wasn't restricted to the Chinese communists, and right at about that time, there was something called McCarthyism in this country. In fact, I can remember uh, my wife and I sitting in Hong Kong, and uh, I was uh, interviewing people with horrendous stories of the effort to control thought, and people would be coming from the United States and dropping in to see us and giving us equally horrendous stories about people being fired from their jobs for subscribing to the wrong journals and the effort to control thought, uh, a less systematic one, but still a uh, uh, destructive one in this country. Uh, and we began to think the whole world was going mad, except maybe the British colonials who were sipping their mint juleps or whatever they were sipping uh, and talking about uh, how extraordinary it was to run India with 300 people. Uh, in any case, uh, the, the totalism is a worldwide uh, issue. Uh, and if you look at what's been going on in this country uh, with the present administration, it's a strong impulse toward totalism, toward what I call reality control. It's more than just spin. It's an attempt to control thought and reverse concepts of reality. It's not just putting a spin on it. Uh, I think that, uh, and this is part of the hope, that the country has begun to break out of it. Uh, not clearly, but the recent elections were very significant. Uh, however much faith one has or doesn't have in those elected, they meant something in terms of this breakout of nightmarish reality control. And I think we, we, we shouldn't forget that or underestimate that. The work on thought reform also had relevance for totalistic cults in this country, uh, and I became involved in that issue indirectly through having written that book. But the next study that I did uh, was a study of Hiroshima survivors in that city in 1962, living there for a period of almost six months. And of course, that really raised to me and raised to the world uh, the whole issue of nuclear weapons, which are apocalyptic simply in their dimensions of destruction. In that study, I also, for the first time, immersed myself in the psychology of survivors and their quest for meaning, for some meaning in terms of what they've gone through. But with the appearance of nuclear weapons and Hiroshima suggesting 
to the world, what I later came to call imagery of extinction, imagery of extinction, we, we get the ultimate hubris related to nuclear weapons, the effort at ownership of death or ownership of life and death through weapons that can annihilate uh, humankind. And of course, there's an impulse to bring all kinds of spiritual assumptions to the weapons themselves because in the past, as we know, it was only God who could destroy the world. Uh, now, if these weapons can do that, isn't there something godly or deified about them? And that has to do with the worship of the weapons or what I call nuclearism or exaggerated embrace of the weapons. And that's a, a major problem. And again, uh, this present administration, as it does in almost all wrong things, exemplifies the problem because um, every single president in the nuclear age, beginning with Harry Truman, has had a deep ambivalence about nuclear weapons, saying sometimes these are ordinary weapons and if we have to use them, we will regretfully use them, and saying on another occasion, usually on retirement, uh, these weapons should never be used. They are too inhuman and should never be used. This administration has shown no such ambivalence. Instead of thinking of ways to eliminate the weapons in the world, it has been preoccupied with finding more creative uses for them, whether in the form of bunker busters or low yield weapons, uh, and in that way has created a psychological and political climate that encourage and motivate other countries to obtain nuclear weapons even as it rails against those countries and threatens military means uh, or even nuclear means of preventing the spread of nuclear weapons. The spread of nuclear weapons is a very severe and dangerous phenomenon. But what this country does in its own nuclearism perpetuates and encourages that spread, that uh, 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 nuclear proliferation, uh, even as the country uh, condemns it. Another study I did, uh, this one mostly in the early 70s of Vietnam veterans, uh, and uh, there are all too many reverberations of that now with Iraq and Iraq veterans, uh, but I'll just mention one or two principles that I came out of that study with that have wider apl applicability. The first is what I came to call the atrocity producing situation. What does that mean? It means that uh, there are certain military situations which due to military policy and a psychological uh, occurrence in the environment, an ordinary person, no better or worse than you or me, can walk into that environment and commit atrocities. It's a kind of internalization of an environment which is very powerful uh, and uh, it, it occurred in relation to uh, certain policies in Vietnam. Some of you may remember those policies of so-called free fire zones or search and destroy missions and body counts. Those were military policies which allowed very free uh, uh, shooting down of civilians. And there was a psychological environment of angry grief because it was dangerous and you were losing buddies and you became angry and hungry for an enemy who was everyone and no one. And in that way, you created the major slaughter, the major event, major atrocity of Viet the Vietnam War at My Lai, but there are other atrocities, perhaps not as large, uh, as the one at My Lai, uh, in which uh, about 500 civilians, mostly old people and, and young children, were gunned down. It was at, after a ceremony the night before that was a mixture of a military pep talk and a, uh, um, a funeral ceremony or a memorial ceremony for a sergeant, who had, a beloved sergeant who had been blown up uh, by a booby trap or a landmine, uh, that me lie occurred and that that psychology of angry grief and military policies created an atrocity producing situation. Uh, and we see that now occurring in Iraq which is a very different kind of war, but uh, it's also a counterinsurgency war in an alien environment against a non-white people where one is 
not popular and where it's impossible to distinguish the enemy from ordinary people, and you create an atrocity-producing situation, which is very much uh, what we now experience in, in Iraq. Now, I learned some hopeful things from that Vietnam study as well. The Vietnam veterans I worked with in rap groups that we formed in New York City over the early 70s uh, could undergo significant change, uh, sometimes in periods of months or even weeks. Uh, now, they, not everything in them changed, but they could change their view about war and peace. They could struggle with their attitudes toward toward women, these were all men at that time, uh, they could look at very important issues of meaning and change significantly while other parts of them didn't change. And that to me, uh, of course, that was also in keeping with work I had thought about earlier and written up later on the protean self that Susanna mentioned, uh, having to do with the uh, mutability of the self and questioning some of psychoanalytic orthodoxy uh, about personality being uh, laid down in the first uh, few years of life. Uh, uh, so uh, people can change under enormous pressures, especially under death encounters and in relationship to survival of death encounters. It was also interesting to hear that some of the Israeli members of groups that were resisting becoming occupiers, um, some of the so-called refuseniks in Israel, so-called courage to refuse is, is the uh, name given in English to them, uh, mostly reservists, many of them officers who refused to fight in the occupied areas, told me that they had been influenced by what the Vietnam veterans had, did, had done and by uh, books like mine and others which uh, articulated this kind of resistance to one's own war as that war was occurring. So these things can be contagious, just as uh, dangerous and violent behavior can be contagious, so can opposition to the same be contagious. I studied Nazi doctors uh, mostly in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, and there are many things one can say about them because more than any group perhaps that I've studied, they, they, they epitomized evil, and they, yet they had their own apocalyptic project, a kind of apocalyptic biology. That is, there could even be an idealistic element to them. I, I, I interviewed, for instance, the, the daughter and the leading disciple of of the leading consultant in the um, so-called biomedical vision, the sterilization program and the racial theory, the leading consultant from the medical side was a man named Rudin who was a Swiss German whom his daughter and, uh, and disciple told me was a more fanatical geneticist than a fanatical Nazi. But he became a fanatical Nazi because they gave him the opportunity to be a fanatical geneticist. Uh, most of the Nazi doctors were not fanatical ideologues. They were people who were corruptible and who could be socialized to evil and move into atrocity-producing situations all too readily. Incidentally, or not so incidentally, it, 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 when I speak of an atrocity-producing situation, of a milieu which one can enter and create atrocities, that doesn't mean that one isn't responsible for what one does. One is still responsible for committing those atrocities. Uh, and in the case of Nazi doctors, uh, there was the phenomenon I came to call killing to heal, in which they had the idea of destroying all uh, bad genes, whether it's uh, in killing centers of where they murdered people and called it euthanasia, or in death camps like Auschwitz. Um, when I did that study, I, I didn't think, I mean, I, I, I did, bring it into medical schools and, and people talked about it, the more sensitive doctors whom I discussed it with try to think about ways in which uh, medical ethics should be looked at in relation to the extremity of Nazi medical misbehavior. But I, may, I mainly did the work in relationship to the medicalization of killing. But uh, now we find that there are problems with American physicians and uh, I did write a piece, and others have written more, about 
physicians' collusion in torture in Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, uh, and Afghanistan. And what I pointed out were at least three ways in which this collusion occurred. They weren't Nazi doctors at all, and, and these were lesser uh, transgressions, but still uh, made more clear by the extreme, extremity of Nazi uh, transgressions. And in Abu Ghraib, for instance, they failed to report injuries that could only have been caused by torture. Uh, they delayed or falsified death certificates in connection with other uh, officers. Uh, and they would turn over medical records and collaborate with interrogators in intense interrogation, which spilled over into torture. These are all direct violations of medical ethics. And it is encouraging that uh, I and others could uh, approach the American Psychiatric Association uh, and have a, a very positive response in, in the association reasserting the transgression against medical commitment to healing uh, in this kind of behavior. Uh, but still, we see in the reflection of physicians' behavior how far this country has gone in its violation of its own principles. It isn't that doctors are expected to be any better than anyone else. It's just that no matter how ordinary and corruptible doctors may be, no more, no less than other people, we as doctors are still committed to healing and we take an oath to that principle. And societies expect doctors to, broadly speaking, hold to that healing oath. And there's something revealed in the extreme about the corruption of a society when that is in some way reversed and the doctors join the ranks of the killers or the torturers. And I think we have to look at it in that way in our own society. Uh, I studied Om Shinrikyo, the fanatical Japanese cult, later on in the mid-90s, uh, and that was a kind of ultimate apocalyptic principle, and I'll say a little bit more about apocalypticism in a moment, but this was a small cult of maybe 10,000 people in Japan, but only four uh, or 500 of them who were closely allied and living together with the, with the guru, and yet they managed to build crudely uh, biological and chemical weapons and sought uh, sought nuclear weapons, fortunately, unsuccessfully. So they tried to con combine ultimate zealotry with ultimate weapons, and that seemed to be, to me, to be to have warning dimensions to the world. Um, it doesn't mean that nuclear danger is greatest from uh, small cults like this, though one should certainly be on the lookout uh, because nuclear technology. Uh, like all technology, becomes increasingly miniaturized and therefore accessible. It's still the major nuclear weapons possessing states that, that create the most danger, including ourselves. But there is, again, this interaction between the two. And as I said earlier, our own nuclearism encourages it, not only in other countries, but in uh, transnational cults. Uh, and in very small non-national groups. Om Shinrikyo was the ultimate apocalyptic cult. There are apocalyptic cults in this country, too. What is an apocalyptic cult? Or what is apocalypticism? Really, it means, uh, you know, in its, in its direct meaning, it's a biblical term that, mean, that means uncovering, but it's, it's come to be associated with uh, the, uh, the idea of a prophecy a prophecy of the end of the world and its regeneration or renewal. Uh, and in the case of Om Shinrikyo, uh, they embraced uh, a principle known in the literature of forcing the end. This is uh, in the work of Gerson Sholem, the great student of Jewish mysticism, who talked about debates in ancient times among the rabbinical or uh, scholars uh, uh, who, who would try to answer the question, since there is known to be a necessity for an era of violence preceding the arrival of the Messiah, is it justified to join in 
that violence and intensify it in, in order to uh, bring about that wished for development, the appearance of the Messiah, sooner. And in their wisdom, the rabbis rejected, according to Sholem, rejected that principle and called it heretical because only God could make that judgment. But there are uh, lots of cultic leaders who are a little less humble than that. And they believe in forcing the end, joining, that's what Om Shinrikyo wanted to do. They wanted to initiate World War III through their explosion of uh, weapons of mass destruction. And World War III would in turn bring about a biblical Armageddon. The world would then be renewed with Om Shinrikyo setting the spiritual principles for it. Um, in, in a way, what I came to call the protean self is a struggle against that kind of apocalyptic self or uh, is a struggle toward some sort of capacity for change and transformation as opposed to the fundamentalist fixity of self. Uh, and there's a constant struggle between the two. Now, I, I've mentioned what apocalypticism is. And really, in that broad definition, it isn't limited to religious movements. Uh, you find lots of apocalypticism in the Nazi movement, as I suggested, and in various expressions of communism. Uh, there's always uh, a destruction of the world, or of much of the world, or a segment of the world, always for the purpose of renewal, so that there can be seen to be a perverse idealism in that apocalyptic uh, violence. And if you look at you know, uh, expressions of violence in this country, Timothy McVeigh, or in the Middle East, um, uh, Jewish violence or uh, Islamic violence, uh, there is likely to be an apocalyptic uh, dimension uh, underneath. For instance, in the murder of Yitzhak Rabin, uh, it was by a Jewish extremist who not only berated Rabin for giving, quotes, giving away Jewish land, but in trying to make some sort of, uh, some sort of uh, agreement uh, with the Palestinians. But also, by doing so, by delaying the appearance of the Messiah, so he felt. And of course, in, in some, of the, uh, uh, some, some of the originals, uh, original positions of Hamas, you've had apocaly apocalyptic ideas as well. So there can be an apocalyptic principle underneath the uh, immediate policy. And it's universal, it's potentially present almost anywhere. We are not immune to it in this country. If you look at the response to 9-11 and the em embarkation on the part of this administration of a so-called war on terrorism, the war on terrorism itself has taken on apocalyptic dimensions. That is, it has no limits in time or space. It can be anywhere in the world at any time. And it has a kind of subtext, not even a subtext, of eliminating terrorists and thereby eliminating evil, as though they could be numbered on a page. And in that way, the problem destroyed and evil uh, rid the world of evil. Uh, that's an American version of apocalypticism, uh, and, and we see it, uh, and it's still operative. It really brings the war against terrorism into the infinite, uh, a situation without limits. And in that way, of course, uh, the Iraq war could be easily connected to the war on terrorism, even though, uh, as we know very well, uh, Saddam Hussein had absolutely nothing to do with 9-11. Now, in this way, there becomes a kind of tandem interaction. Uh, uh, after Kurt Vonnegut, I called it a duty dance of death, between um, bin Laden's apocalyptic violence and our own. They nurture and stimulate each other. They're not the same. They have to be distinguished, and you can describe the differences between them. But they do interact with each other in an equilibrium that tends to block out the in-between, which is the rest of human beings who would prefer to live in peace and without this kind of uh, extremity of violence. 
these apocalyptic currents are widespread in the United States. Uh, we, we know about it in, in terms of the religious right. We've seen all too much evidence of it. Uh, it was interesting that uh, Bush could be characterized by Woodward, who was at that time quite favorably disposed toward the administration, as carrying through what he called God's master plan. He saw himself as an agent of the deity from things that he said, uh, and in that sense, the war on terrorism was given a kind of holy dimension. But you can have a parallel apocalypticism uh, and extremity or totalism that's secular as well. There are a number of people in the administration, some of the worst people, like Cheney and Rumsfeld uh, until recently in the administration and others, who don't necessarily share that kind of, that version of religious extremism. Their extremism has to do with American hegemony or the um, sense of entitlement that they feel America has to dominate the world. Uh, and, and that also can take on an apocalyptic quality of destroying that which seems to violate what America considers to be necessary in the name of renewing the world in the American image. Now, that creates, of course, considerable superpower vulnerability because it's a kind of task that can't be realized. And uh, the superpower syndrome, that sense of entitlement to control all the regions of the world, because we are the strongest military power in the world, uh, involves the uh, American uh, people. And there comes to be a sense of fear whenever it is brought out and made clear that the mission is not possible to achieve. And the fear has to do with terrorism. It has to do with nuclear weapons. It has to do with uncontrollable situations, as in Iraq. So we have the paradox of the militarily strongest nature, the most powerful nation in the world, perhaps the most fearful. And of course, the fear is played upon for political reasons uh, by the administration. This is the American version of empire. <clears throat> it's not uh, creating uh, bureaucracies on the ground that stay and uh, control an area and a people, as did the British Empire. It's rather a what I call fluid world control. The effort is to use high technology to control the outcome of history in various places, <clears throat> so that when you look for reasons of our, and you see this, I'm not, <clears throat> this doesn't just come out of my words. If you look at the national security strategy documents uh, as they've been issued every year, they pretty much say this uh, almost directly. It's a, a sense of entitlement to the ownership of history, the ownership of history, another impossible project. And when you look at the invasion of uh, Iraq well, was it weapons of mass destruction that didn't turn out to exist, or uh, regime change creating democracy, or uh, Iraqi oil? Uh, of course, it was uh, all these things, but they're all subsumed to the idea of ownership of history, or uh, what I'm calling fluid world control. And that's what we've seen take shape. And, and that has its, of course, uh, apocalyptic dimensions. I promised you I'd come to the good news. Uh, if it is good news, it, it, it's not necessarily good news, but it's uh, news that is hopeful. And that's important that we work from. Uh, and that has to do with the ways in which we survive these three extraordinary traumas of the last few decades. Uh, Vietnam, 9-11, and, uh, and the Iraq War. And above all, that means the meanings that we give them, because the psychological meanings we give them are inseparable from political meanings and ethical meanings and political uh, policies. Uh, I've worked a lot with survivors, and survivors have uh, a series of reactions, survivors of direct survivors of death encounters. I should say that direct survivors are those who have been 
say, survivors of Auschwitz or of Iraq, of Vietnam, or in the towers at 9-11. Uh, and then there are the distant survivors who are the rest of us who are affected by these events and have survivor-like emotions, but from a great distance and a much less visceral way. Survivors retain uh, Im imprints of the death encounter, indelible imagery. They struggle with issues of feeling and numbing. They struggle with self-blame, even though it's, uh, in a sense, unfair or self-condemnation. Uh, they study with suspicion of other people and suspicion of the counterfeit. But the overall task of survivors is, psychologically speaking, is to find meaning in that death encounter, which they require if they're to have meaning for the rest of their lives. Uh, and in that sense, the meaning they give to the death encounter really affects uh, meanings of everything that happens with them. And these meanings can be very different. They can be polarized. You know, no event, no matter how extreme, contains inherent meaning. The meaning is derived from what we construct about it, what survivors construct about it, immediate survivors and distant survivors. If you look at the Holocaust, um, you, you, you might remember that there was a group called the Jewish Defense League, which had a motto, never again. It was a quasi-fascist organization that felt it was OK to be violent toward all Arabs who had disagreed with them because they uh, portrayed them as Nazis. Uh, uh, but at, the ba at about the time that the Jewish Defense League was given, giving that meaning to the Holocaust, a group of Auschwitz survivors came, and I met with them. and. Uh, Mi Lai had just been revealed uh, in the late 60s, and uh, they were horrified by it, this group that I met with. And they said, we want to make some statements saying it's too close. It's not the same thing, but it's too close to what we experienced in Auschwitz, and therefore to condemn the kind of behavior that occurred at Mi Lai. So here were two groups uh, that were dominated by survivor experience and survivor meaning, but bringing the opposite meaning to the Holocaust. Not even the Holocaust gives us inherent meaning. We have to create and work for meaning, taking the truths of the Holocaust uh, as our basis. Now, very often, the meanings that become established publicly are given by those distant from them, uh, the, the more distant survivors or historical survivors that, that I mentioned. And there can be a lot of intermingling of survivor emotions. When we survive something like these things, we associate to uh, more individual survivals we've had of losses or um, traumas. Uh, and everything can become merged in the psyche. That's the way the psyche is. And various survivals can blend. And that's why the Bush administration could have some success, at least for a while, in the blending of, um, of Iraq and 9-11, even though they had nothing to do with each other. But looking at these three survivals very briefly, from that perspective, let me say that about Vietnam, when the Vietnam War was coming to an end, most of the country took as survivor meaning and a survivor mission from that meaning the idea that we don't get involved anymore in wars without any clear purpose in distant places, uh, and that we should avoid this. But at the same time, there were groups in this country that were taking the opposite meaning from it. So that George Bush Sr., in declaring victory in the first Gulf War, 91, said as his main passionate words, by God, we've kicked the Vietnam syndrome once and for all. Vietnam syndrome being synonymous with American weakness, and a group of people, uh, some of them uh, much more extreme than George Bush Sr., the ones advising George Bush Jr., uh, took as a, as a survivor meaning the need to redirect American military power into the world, to project it into the world with new vigor. And this has been written about very cogently by James Mann in his book, The Rise of the Vulcans, so that there was that opposite meaning of Vietnam. And in that way, the Iraq War is a projection of American power in the world with that idea of controlling history or owning history. It's a survivor mission. It's many things, but among them, a survivor mission. If you look at 9-11, the immediate, the immediate survivor mission 
of the administration, which it declared as the only American survivor mission, was the war on terrorism, which had, as I tried to suggest, its own apocalyptic features. Uh, but there were others among us who said, no, this is not what we should take from it. Even at the beginning, a number of us were suggesting, yes, this is a dreadful event. It's a crime against humanity, 9-11, in Nuremberg terms. It was that. Uh, but one should look behind it and look into its causes and use violence in a minimal way to track down only those immediate perpetrators. It's the very opposite of the amorphous war on terrorism. And to try to understand uh, what was behind their action, because there were genuine grievances, it must be assumed, beyond their uh, violent and unacceptable uh, behavior. But even that cautious alternative survivor meaning was condemned by this administration as the talk of people who weren't patriotic or were being traitorous. Uh, and, and that's been a struggle that has gone on ever since uh, the occurrence of 9-11. And the Bush administration has played on 9-11 shamelessly, including manipulating fears about new attacks of terrorism, and has had an interest in sustaining that survivor meaning and that survivor mission, all from the standpoint of the superpower syndrome with its entitlement to control the world. There was nothing more humiliating to the proponents of the superpower syndrome than 9-11. Here was a, a terrorist group that didn't even have a state uh, to call its own that could penetrate our central institutions. And in that humiliation, the reaction, the survivor meaning, took on vengeful qualities as well as uh, qualities of reasserting absolute American power on the world and controlling history. Most Americans, of course, have been in between, and of course, there have been families of people killed in 9-11 who have insisted upon more humane forms of survivor meaning and survivor mission, including those who demanded that we investigate the causes of 9-11 and who were critical about American behavior in 9-11. One group called the Jersey, Jersey Girls uh, and others who uh, really brought the authority they had as immediate survivors into the political process in constructive ways. If you look at Iraq, um, well, Iraq, of course, was planned a long time before 9-11 in keeping with this idea of the administration of a, of a kind of um, uh, control of history. Uh, nonetheless, it became a survivor mission for 9-11 in ways that I've mentioned of projecting American power onto the world and controlling the Middle East. But once the war began, you then have a struggle between the traditional survivor mission in wartime and an alternative survivor mission. The traditional survivor meaning and mission is wartime is that the dead must not have died in vain. And therefore, in the name of the dead, we must intensify the war so that their death will not be in vain. And uh, it, it, it was Cindy Sheehan's courage and others like her in a group called Military Families Speak Out that questioned precisely that. Cindy Sheehan could say, I don't want my son's death to be given the meaning of requiring additional war making. That then raises the alternative survivor meaning, which brings up the terrible question of whether the war had any justification, whether that death had any justification. That's what a death encounter is about. And uh, where that justification is questioned, you're getting at the most painful collective emotions, and the country has been in the midst of these uh, ever since Vietnam, and of course before that. Even the present effort at expanding the war under the name of surge is a further collective reading or survivor meaning of not letting the dead have died in vain. And President Bush still constantly uh, expresses that phrase. Uh, so it, it should be seen in this psychological light as well as in a, a political light and a manipulative light and an effort of a group to keep on pressing in order to avoid being seen 
as having been profoundly wrong in the first place. Uh, however, this alternative survivor meaning has taken hold among Americans who reject this war now. Iraq, American veterans of Iraq are emerging and speaking out, and, and they have an alliance in many cases with Vietnam veterans, and there's a generational, trans, generational transmission of critical feelings about one's own war while it's being fought that is more readily achieved in these two generations than could be achieved between World War II veterans and uh, Vietnam veterans, who were also a generation apart, because World War II was considered a necessary, a terrible war, but one that had to be fought ag against a, a genuine evil that was out there. And therefore, World War II veterans could have great difficulty with their sons in rejecting their own war at the time it was being fought. This is not the case in many ways between many uh, Vietnam and Iraq veterans. There is a vast human tradition for this alternative anti-war survivor meaning. You just need to look at Homer's Iliad, and when you read it, of course, it, 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 it's, a, uh, it's an expression of, of warrior hero, heroism, but it also has cries of pain in which there are voices which, are, uh, which you hear expressed very powerfully throughout the Iliad which say, this, there's too much suffering, the suffering is not worth it, that death cannot be justified. Here we find the beginnings in Western uh, written thought of the alternative survivor mission questioning the standard warrior ethos of uh, deaths not being in vain, justifying further war making. Because in that way, of course, war always begets war. And in the alternative survivor mission, insofar as you can express it and sustain it, you're interrupting that sequence of war making. And we've seen that happen, uh, not only in Homer's Iliad, World War I produced the whole literature of survivor meaning and survivor mission, condemning the slaughter in the trenches and war making. And then in the Vietnam War, certainly John Kerry reached his greatest moment in 1971 in testifying before a Senate subcommittee in saying, how can we ask a man to be the last man to die in, Viet in Vietnam, the last man to die for a mistake? He was, along with the Vietnam veterans against the war, reversing and contending against the traditional warrior ethos in favor of an alternative uh, ethos uh, of an anti-war basis. And it was interesting that with all the mistakes Kerry made in running, his anti-war sentiment could be accepted. What the country had more trouble accepting with the help of uh, Republican falsehoods w was the extent of American participation in atrocity. That's harder for Americans to take in, because we like to see ourselves as a decent people who are not warrior-like and who don't engage in atrocities. Of course, any group can engage in atrocity, uh, given the creation of, in wartime, of atrocity-producing situations. So in, in my closing remarks, let me say that survivor illumination, then, is possible. Uh, it's possible in our present situation. It's occurring in fits and starts in our country, but ways that are important. I've been interested in looking toward the potential wisdom of survivors, survivors of Hiroshima who travel the world, telling people what one small atomic bomb can do to a city, or people like Camus, Vonnegut, and even Gunter Grass, who bring survivals of atrocities in World War II to bear uh, on their world in illuminating ways. And this is possible for us now. Uh, we are indeed in the midst of struggling to bring it about. In that way, America is capable of recovering its moral compass, of giving up its claim to totalism, and indeed giving up its exaggerated victim consciousness. I went back to Hiroshima some years after I did the original study, and I was interested to hear a survivor leader saying, you know, uh, 
we're looking critically now at victim consciousness. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, some victims become so obsessed, some, some survivors become so obsessed with having been victimized that they can't do anything else with their lives. I said, well, what do you do about that? He said, well, we talk about it. And we took them to meet a group of Holocaust survivors, and they shared their experiences. And there can then be the sense of suffering, not limited to any particular group. It's as if what happened at 9-11 has been, uh, in, America, in some American eyes, given us a kind of corner on victimization and suffering, and that being a rationale for the apocalyptic violence that we have brought to the world subsequently. Uh, of course, this means uh, a critical view of totalism. Uh, David Tracy, a very gifted theologian, has written a book called Plurality and Ambiguity, saying that most great religious figures struggled with belief and had all kinds of ambiguous and pluralistic ideas that were part of their religious struggle. And that was really what, uh, what I was talking about in connection with the protean self. William James, a, a great American figure, one of our greatest in these areas, spoke of a pluralistic, restless universe for which no single point of view can ever take in the whole scene. But to a mind possessed of the love of unity at any cost, it will no doubt remain forever unacceptable. That's an interesting critique of those who would advocate uh, an American Leviathan. Albert Camus was a great figure in all this, and Camus said that if we're to live and die as human beings, we need to refuse to be a god and embrace thought which recognizes limits. Thought which recognizes limits. Camus also said, rather pithily, he who does not know everything cannot kill everyone. <laughs> Let me say in closing that survivors can either close down or open out. Survivors can close down and stay fixed in their psychic numbing and fantasies of revenge, or they can open out and take in some kind of truth from the world about death and about life. In connection with these three vast American traumas of recent decades, and particularly now with the Iraq War, we can either close down and sustain our uh, apocalyptic war on terrorism, or we can open out and take in truths that question the use of violence and that contribute to uh, the diminution rather than increase in the world's violence. Marshall Meyer, whom we're honoring tonight, was a survivor who opened himself to the world and acted upon it. I think we best honor his memory in our own efforts to do the same. I'll close with a couple of quotations because it's always the artist who can say these things uh, so eloquently. And, and the first is, is from Seneca 2,000 years ago, a great statesman and, and writer. Uh, he said, power over life and death, don't be proud of it. Whatever they fear from you, you'll be threatened with. And finally, Theodore Rutger, the great American lyric poet, in a dark time, the eye begins to see. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. I, I appreciate the warm reception, and I've been made to feel very much at home here, but I'd like to hear from you now. Any thoughts or reactions or questions after you catch your breath from having heard me sound off? Let's hear from, from you. Yes, there's a hand. I'd like to thank you for a very, very powerful presentation and give you some evidence that this is indeed a syndrome. We have been told repeatedly that this is conservative. Our colleague Jeff Parr in the English department, who is one of the founders of the National Review and is clearly conservative, has, uh, has just written an introduction to his new book, The Making of the American Conservative Mind, which is, I think, probably the greatest critique of the, of the Bush presidency. And it gives an example of what you mean. 
and you won't believe who wrote this. This is somebody saying about going into attacking Iraq, quote, once you get into Baghdad, it's not clear what you do with it. It's not clear what kind of government you put in place of the one that's there now. This is going to be a Shia regime, a Sunni regime, or one that tilts toward the Ba'athists, or one that tilts toward the Islamic fundamentalism? How much credibility is that going to have if it's set up by the American military there? How long does the American military have to stay there to protect the people to sign on to that government and what happens when we leave? That was written by Dick Cheney in 1931. The point is, this is not conservative, it's not liberal, it's crazy. <laughs> I agree with everything you said, but I would add that the craziness has to do with a kind of ideological fanaticism. Don't minimize the ideology underneath and its apocalyptic possibilities, whether it's secular or religious in this administration, and therefore in the American grain to some extent. But I agree with you completely. Oh, I agree with you too. Yeah, okay. There was, a hand, uh, there was another hand over there. Yes, please. Um, thank you for your wonderful lecture. I'm a psychiatrist. Yes, I am. And uh, I, I've also worked in uh, conflict and post-conflict zones in a number of places around the world, and uh, as well as with torture survivors here. I'm interested in this concept of uh, atrocity-producing situation. And if you could you help us understand some more of your thoughts about how individuals move into the atrocity-producing situation as they often do, say, for yeah. example, Liberia yeah. or Cambodia, but even more importantly, how, if you're working in a post-conflict community, do you help individuals move out of that context and, and to yeah. normalize it? Well, that, you're raising profound mm -hmm. questions, and I'll try to um, respond. The, um, the, the problem then becomes not the evil of individual people, or that can contribute uh, clearly, or the wrong-headedness or the ideological extremity, but, uh, but the creation of institutions and political structures that are geared toward highly destructive behavior. So pr probably the most extreme atrocity-producing situation that we can think of uh, would be a Nazi doctor arriving in Auschwitz. Maybe he hasn't, in most cases, he hasn't killed anybody at all until he got to Auschwitz. But now he, he's um, socialized into that environment uh, by various means that I tried to write about. And he internalizes that environment. And we all have to survive in an immediate environment in some degree. We can have various defenses. We can resist some aspects of it. But we have to internalize a significant amount of it. Uh, now, I th and, and therefore, the problem then becomes, the first point, I would say, the problem becomes that of creating or avoiding atrocity-producing situations in the political and social and ethical and religious structures that one builds and creates. Um, in terms of individuals and what they do in them, uh, there are some individuals who have the uh, moral courage to resist an atrocity producing situation. When Marshall Meyer went around criticizing that murderous government in Argentina and, and trying to give, give some solace to uh, people who, whose child, uh, children had disappeared, had been kidnapped, um, he, was, uh, he was violating an atrocity producing situation. He was refusing to be socialized to it in some important way. Uh, that was true of a man named Ron Reidenauer, a journalist who did much toward revealing me lie. And uh, there, was, uh, there have been one or two soldiers in Iraq who reported the killing of civilians. These are whistleblowers who, um, who, who deny and reject the atrocity producing situation. It's hard to know exactly in psychological terms how they have the moral strength to do that. Uh, it has to do with their families, and it has to do with their communities prior to the atrocity producing situation. Uh, but this isn't entirely predictable in some laboratory or scientific way. And um, in terms of helping somebody out of an atrocity producing situation, I guess you have to show them the world outside in some way. That's why um, 
there's been something so dreadful and discouraging and self-destructive about this administration in walling itself off from the enormous criticism of the Iraq war long before it began that was worldwide. Uh, it refused to take in that uh, ideological extremity will, will block out alternative ideas. In, in, um, <clears throat> the, there's one place where I try to write about this in some detail at the end of my book, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Total. My very first book, I talked about the, uh, the characteristics of totalism. And if you can recognize those characteristics, you can start, initiate some kind of critique. And it has to do with milieu control. It has to do with doctrine over person. It has to do with dispensing of existence. And uh, one has to be shown the alternatives to that environment. Uh, and that's helped, as I said, by prior uh, moral evolution, but it's always a struggle. Uh, and finally, I would say that we have to realize that extreme environments can go very far in influencing human behavior, even among people who aren't inherently bad. Yes? I'm struck by uh, your comments on the survivorship, and I'm not a psychologist. So for those who didn't hear it, she's talking about these um, sequences that Cougar Ross, a, a, a psychiatrist, originally described for survivors of loss of uh, the, the death of a family member or somebody very close. And it, it had to do with denial, then anger, and then acceptance. And does society undergo that kind of sequence in relationship to the large traumas that I mentioned? I would say yes, but not necessarily in exactly that clear cut of fashion. Even with individuals, it, it, it isn't necessarily as clear-cut a sequence as, and she knew that, as Kuba Ross described. And uh, with, with societies, um, there's a heavy political input, and, and it's manipulated for political purposes, but the emotions are there to be manipulated, especially the anger. And in a way, I think there's a truth to your question in the sense that the Bush administration could manipulate post 9-11 emotions of denial and anger and create its own extreme survivor mission of the apocalyptic war on terrorism. Uh, so those issues, uh, those emotions were at issue in a collective way. Uh, they're very disorderly and in a way the political manipulators try to give them a kind of exaggerated order as though the war on terror would, in a way, the war on terror is an expression of anger and it furthers denial. Denial that, you know, any nation is in some way vulnerable. It's part of life to be vulnerable and it's part of collective life to be collectively vulnerable in some degree. Uh, and so it is denial in the sense that one can be so omnipotent as a superpower within the superpower syndrome that one can totally control all events. That is an, an aspect of denial. But one has to look at it. One has to be careful not to uh, equate individual psychological experience directly and fully with collective experience, but to look for very important in indicators from individual experience, I would say. I think, th yes. Very much. As you can tell from my accent, I'm going to originate from the United States, and um, I've just come back. Speak louder, sorry. Um, is that better? Yes. I've just come back from the United Nations, uh, where we were writing a human rights treaty for yes, yeah. with disabilities, and I guess um, what I have to say is more of a comment than a question. But I'd be interested in what you have to say about it. 
and that is that I believe that some of the, um, the atrocities um, are indicative of the atrocities that are actually happening invisibly um, within our own society and um, that we condone. And as we listen to some of the atrocities that happen to people with disabilities um, in the name of trying to celebrate normality, whatever that may be, um, it struck me that, uh, that this sort of behaviour is rife in both our society and in many, many other societies in all sorts of insidious ways. And perhaps this paves the way for, for more visible atrocities um, to happen in a way that is condoned. Yes, uh, well, I, I think you're right. I agree with your comment. And I would say that, uh, just to give it terms, uh, the atrocities in the society, especially toward those who have little voice uh, in the society, whether they're handicapped or the poor or whether it's racial, uh, these uh, create a pattern, a habitual pattern of numbing so that one walls oneself off from them and then it becomes a lot easier to uh, transfer that numbing into international behavior in which you are walled off in the name of an American purpose, an alleged American purpose, from the human beings that are being slaughtered in your name. They are related. I agree with your comment. Yes. Um, I, I was struck by your, uh, by your uh, finding solace and hope in various forms of bird life, and I picked out the canary in the mine and the ostrich with its head in the sand. <laughs> chicken hawk as a uh, <laughs> problem of current administration, but my question um, is, is more, uh, I guess, more serious than that and not bird-related. Bird uh, well, it birds, is, are serious. birds are serious. Uh, <laughs> uh, it is that I, I uh, read in the paper this morning that, that uh, President Bush is giving his uh, uh, State of the Union address at a point when 71% of the American public thinks the country is on the wrong track. Now, I have been tracking that figure for a number of years, and the figure was up into 60% back in the Clinton administration, and it's taken a huge, or a big jump in the last uh, few months, in the last couple of years, because of Bush administration policies on a number of fronts, I think, you know, Katrina, Iraq, and other things. But, I mean, what, what can you make of the American psyche, or the American psycho-historical moment, or what's going on in this country, individually and collectively, when 60% of the country, 60 to 71% of the country thinks the country's on the wrong track. Are we on the wrong track even to think that we're on a track, or is the country really on the wrong track and we're going down the tubes? Like I see Niall Ferguson had a new book, uh, it's called War of the World, uh, uh, The Decline of the West, Spengler, a hundred years later, or I understand there's a Chinese economist who's written a book called um, managing the American decline. Do you really think <laughs> most Americans? So, I, I, I guess, yeah, go ahead. No. Uh, part of what I think you're raising is the question of whether we're experiencing a, uh, a uniquely bad and destructive administration, and that's our main problem, or, or whether there's a larger problem of American decline that is more fundamental. Uh, I would first, let, let me speak to the, the first one. I think that the damage done by this administration uh, is almost incalculable. It, uh, it, it, I was talking to Ken Yellowitz about this earlier, and it reaches every single sphere of life, uh, and uh, it's been destructive consistently in every way, and it'll take decades, especially internationally, but in other ways too. Uh, domestically as well, to undo even part of it. Having said that, this country created the Bush presidency. Our system of checks and balances didn't exactly check or balance uh, at, at this point. And, uh, and within the system now, given a mixture of modern technology and ideological fanaticism, it can be worked or manipulated to create an almost monolithic country. Um, <clears throat> I think that the American emergence of World War II with such power in the world, uh, it was said there were, there were two superpowers because they both had the bomb, but 
America was really the only post-World War II superpower in terms of all other aspects of society, and it had a, a lot of uh, moral uh, respect at the end of World War II as well. That position of world hegemony was unique in modern history, I think, uh, and uh, there has to be some decline for the world to even achieve some kind of balance. Uh, so there is some of the second as well, some of that decline. So, but I don't think then that either of your possibilities need be the only ones. We've had a dreadful administration, undoubtedly the worst in American history. Um, we, we have a certain amount of inevitable American decline. There is a possibility of being a leading world power in a more moderate and humane way. That's not impossible within American history and traditions. Uh, and everything, none of that is gonna happen smoothly, but uh, everything depends upon what we all do. I don't, I don't think it's inevitable that we're headed down the tube. Uh, we have it in our power to do things that can alter that outcome. Avoid being dodo. <laughs> okay. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, yes, there's a hand here. Uh, I'm a mathematician by profession, and maybe I have a propensity to uh, believe in logic and information, reliable information. And I've often wondered, as I've discovered in my adult life, uh, that logic or reason. Rational thought and reliable information don't seem to carry the day in American politics. And uh, I wonder, um, I recently read a little book, which I'm sure many people have read, by a man named Lakoff called Don't Think About an Elephant. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to, dis to talk about how people make political decisions, uh, only they're not exactly decisions, they're more political feelings and reactions. And uh, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about can anything be done to improve the role of uh, rationality and, and information in American political decision making? Well, <coughs> I've heard people use we'll end, we'll, in other words, we'll, we'll, we'll end with a very. We to encourage the reality based community. We'll, we'll end on a very small, easily soluble problem. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I understand. I don't think Americans are any more rational or irrational than any other people. Um, I do think that, in a way, we'll never achieve mathematical purity in political thinking or examination of evidence, and probably even mathematicians don't achieve mathematical purity uh, in, in terms of a requirement for some sort of uh, imagination or emotional life that may take one into a different uh, thought process. But uh, having said that, it's always a kind of balance, and I think we require also outlets for, I would not say irrational, but non-rational side. The, uh, I'm, I'm influenced by a great um, movement of the principle of symbolization in the work of Ernst Cassirer and Suzanne Langer later in this country, and it's in William James, whom I quoted, and others too, in which it's not a question of the rational and the non-rational, it's the way we symbolize and give expression to um, our thoughts and, and, and uh, our loyalties and, and convictions. So there will always be emotions, that's a very central, or, and feelings, these are central aspects of human experience, but can we create a, a political and ethical field in our social and <clears throat> religious and political life <clears throat> in which there's room for uh, both the additional amount of reason and respect for evidence which you ask for, and I honor that, we need that, as well as outlets for these non-rational dimensions interacting with uh, our reason. I'll take one last question.